Today I'm going to talk about perfect imperfection. That might sound like a contradiction in terms. It might sound like an oxymoron, but in actual fact, it's the philosophy. It's, it's how I work. It's my entire career. It's the principle for seeking out who I seek out. I should probably tell you what I do for a living. I'm a photographer. Um, I photograph people. I'm asked in the commercial world, world to take a likeness of people. Uh, or as I call a loveness, because really, people want to look better than they normally do. And, uh, you know, the whole thing is, is that I understand this to a degree, but hopefully I can convince you to at least consider another form of perfection or of beauty um, by the end of my talk. But first I should probably talk to you about the people who are easy to shoot the perfection that's easy to come by. I'm lucky enough to shoot some very interesting people. They're very symmetrical, and they're born beautiful. And so really, it's a matter of just pointing my camera and shooting. It's sometimes a little scary, but uh, but the point is, is that there is an inherent beauty in obviously be beautiful people, and it's easy to achieve. But for me, as a visual person, a communicator visually, what I want to do is I want to tell stories, and I want to elicit something a little bit more. So I want to talk about where we are with beauty today, not just in the media, not just with Western culture, with, with, with where we are as, as a society. As a photographer, we have a lot of tools of the trade ever since the uh, beginning, the advent of photography. And I should note these aren't my photos now. Um, <laughs> in old Hollywood, you could put Vaseline on the lens to uh, take 20 years off someone's life. You could use filters to make them look softer, their features enhanced. Some people uh, do it for me. They have a little Botox. Uh, well, little collagen, and some shouldn't. <laughs> Photoshop is now a term that everyone uses. You don't have to be a photographer to know this. It's part of everyday language. It's, uh, it's something that uh, is used sometimes derogatorily because we know that with Photoshop, you can transform a person into a more idealized, beautiful version of themselves that they never even would become in real life. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Why, why do we do that? Why do we want to do that? Why do we want to put this artifice on ourselves with our photos? The language that we speak anywhere, you look at a magazine, and you're going to see that you're not really, you're not really seeing the real person. And we know this. We know with the celebrities, the personalities, anyone who is portrayed in media with a portrait, or even in portraits where you're shot, on the corner portrait studio. There are things that you can do to enhance. We have this guy to blame. If anyone knows about beauty, it's this beautiful creature. Um, that's Socrates. And we're going to go back to the Greek culture, because that's really where beauty and perfection, uh, at least in the traditional portrait sense, uh, was, I guess, invented. The philosophers, uh, Socrates uh, and Plato, um, they believed that beauty was perfect. The beauty was this perfect, aspirational ideal. Like justice, beauty was, was unattainable by mere mortals. And the whole idea was to endeavor to attain it. So the artists at the time were going, well, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to get perfection? Well, they created gods. Side by side, you see Hermes, messenger god, and Augustus Caesar, a, a mortal you're going to note very little difference. And this is because we're having, we have an ethos, uh, you know, at the time and, and even now, that you have to create something perfect. You have to idealize and show, I mean, if it's going to be an immortal piece of art, why not? And so you have gods embodying humans and humans looking like gods. And, uh, and it just gets better. Pythagoras created a formula called the golden ratio. And the golden ratio, based on pi, was uh, really turning beauty into mathematics. It was talking about perfect proportion. And uh, some of the great pieces
pieces of art and architecture, like the Parthenon, were used with the uh, golden ratio as its uh, original design. We'll cut to modern time now. Uh, Dr. Stephen Marquart, a uh, noted plastic surgeon, used the golden ratio, used the formula from the golden ratio, and he created a mask of perfect proportion, angles, proportion, balance, and symmetry. Now this mask, he said, you could put over a face, and if it was a beautiful face, it would match perfectly. So I uh, put this over works of art throughout the ages. And I'm not the first person to do this. This is a, uh, it's been proven time and again that really, and besides her luscious lips, even Angelina falls in line. But why? Why do we find this mathematically perfect symmetry and proportion beautiful as a rule? Well, we're going to move now to the late 1800s where the cousin of Charles Darwin, no less, was playing around with photography at the time. He was compositing, compositing images together, and uh, he took criminals as his experiment. He wanted to see if he could composite a lot of notorious criminals of the time together into one shot to see if there were features that were common in criminals, perhaps seek out the uh, criminals before they commit a crime or something. That didn't happen, but one thing that all his colleagues agreed on was after he composited all these images into this artificial person, he was a very good looking person. And that was curious to them. Now it's known as facial averaging. It's a technique universities use, sociologists use when they want to look at a section of society, ethnicity, what you do, and what I've done, is I've took a cross-section of people, ethnically diverse, light skin, dark skin, light hair, dark hair, every difference in the world, and I morphed them together into this. This is not a human, that's why I say this. This person isn't real, but they're an ideal. And something that happens, and it's happened time and again, the last two decades when, since this technology um, came about was that people would judge um, these shots, these artificial shots, and they would always deem them more beautiful than the parts that made up a society. And you could do this with any society. Why is this happening? Because facial averaging averages out the faces. And just remember I'm mentioning the word averaging a bit. I'm trying to make a point, I'm not very subtle. But the averaging and what is seen as beautiful is the taking away of the personality, the taking away of the distinct features. This all happens, and it's all very physiological now. We've gone to mathematics to physiology, so uh, I never thought as a photographer I had this much knowledge, which I didn't. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's, there's a word called coinophilia, and it sounds dirty, but uh, what it is, is it's the primal instinct in us all to try to find a mate. And what we're looking for, in the very most basic sense, is we're looking for someone who can carry on our gene, carry on the name. It's an instinctive thing. Um, and we want perfection. We want someone who has survived and their genes to be perfect genes. So what do we instinctively look for? We look for symmetry. We look for the golden ratio. We look for the mask. We look for a perfect face without any degradation. It's an instinctive thing. I mean, we all have our opinions on who we like, but that's what the instinct is. In the back of the brain, there's called, what's called, the scientists have found, the fusiform. The fusiform is at the end of the optic nerve, and it's what actually recognizes family and loved ones and people we meet. It's the area in the brain that does that. It's also the area that recognizes beauty. So what it does is it scans a face, and the more it has to work, the more it finds distinct features, be they considered beautiful or interesting or not, the more it deems it less beautiful, or less attractive, I should say. And so, if it's easy on the eyes, then it's seen as beautiful. And again, this goes back to the averaging. It's, if it's feature-less, if it's almost wallpaper, and you could put side by side all the Greek sculptures, supermodels, and de they're deemed beautiful indeed, but if you were a police sketch artist and you're trying to describe one of those Greek statues if they committed a crime, you'd be hard-pressed to actually give any features. 
well, surely there must be another form of beauty that's longer lasting, that's deeper. As a portrait artist, as a, as a photographer, that's what I'm seeking out. Well, thankfully there is, and it predates the uh, Greek culture of um, beauty and perfection. It's called wabi-sabi, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's, as roughly translated to, uh, to English, it is the beauty and imperfection. It's the beauty and imperfection, and isn't that a beautiful, beautiful thought to not hide our, our imperfection, but to celebrate it, to celebrate what it is to be an individual, all our cracks and flaws. The best thing I can do is t tell a story that the Japanese tell when they describe wabi-sabi. So there was a great emperor and he had a tea servant and the tea servant basically saved his whole life for a tea cart. It's this beautiful made of China tea cart. He went to the emperor after serving him one day and he said, do you not think, oh great emperor, that this is the most beautiful tea cart you'd ever seen? The emperor looked at it and said, I had not noticed. Dejected the servant, went home and crushed the cart to thousands of pieces. Knowing that that was the way he had to make money as a servant, he painstakingly glued every piece back together. When next he was serving the great emperor, the emperor pulled him aside and said, now this, this is a beautiful cart. This is wabi-sabi. And it's the beauty in the things that we would typically sweep under the rug. It's really about the celebration of what makes us human. And so I'm going to share with you some of my photography now. And they're certainly not symmetrical. But what they are, are perfectly imperfect people. These are my winter swimmers that I shot in Russia, Australia, and America. Sight impaired, they just go to swim. Sunspots, freckles, I'm not photoshopping anything out. But the thing is, is that there's a story in every one of these. They make you laugh, they make you smile, they make you do something, but you remember them. He's opened up one too many beer bottles, but uh, he is Australian. So, uh, so the, these are the, my winter swimmers. And this is me discovering what it is about people that I like. It's not the perfection, it's, it's the character. It's what, what makes you linger longer and not have that fusy form go, yep, okay, perfect, yeah, that's beautiful, what's next? I want you to linger longer. These are my aging boxers. They have the fighting spirit in their eyes, but the body of a grandfather. Age has not been kind to them, but they're human. This is, this is what happens. This is life. And I want to capture that. There's something beautiful about that, about the spirit I find anyway in their eyes. This series is my Circus Freak series and Sideshow Performer. Now, Circus Freak, it's a politically incorrect word, but in actual fact, this is what a lot of these guys consider themselves. I travel around America, or I had them come to me, and they're little people, sword swallowers, Gypsies, blockheads. And I tried to find the beauty. I wanted them just to be themselves. I shot in black and white. I just shot their heads because I wanted to find the story just in that one area. This is a real bearded lady. And that does look painful. So does that. But what I did was I asked a few of them what beauty meant to them. And this is what they said. I think people don't accept imperfection that well. They gawk at it, they stare at it because it's curious to them. It's a shame because there's so much beauty out there besides beauty. When I see a typical beautiful person, it's a very plain Jane. To me, there's no depth in that picture. They are so perfect, you can't see any story and their personality. I think I'm ugly and tall. But my wife, she married me. So I guess there is beauty in people like me. 
I'm most beautiful when I try to be myself the best way I can be. If you try and look at something else and go, oh, I want to look like her because she's a supermodel and I'm supposed to look like that, and then you find yourself 50 years later and you were never able to look like whatever that was. If you had spent all of that trying to be yourself the best way you could be, I think then you can't help but be beautiful. I think other people find my face interesting, and maybe that's what they find beautiful about it. The, the reason that I've gone through with what I've gone through was dependent upon it being appealing to me, to me finding myself to be beautiful, you know, to being a good look. What I consider beautiful is something that is different, may by some folks be considered imperfect. I love the differences in faces or in physical features. I always think that's the most beautiful, the most interesting or in the way someone holds their body. You know, you can see that some people have gone through a lot of struggle and they still stand every day and make it through it. And I think that's beautiful. Here's the point. I don't blame people for wanting to look the best they can in a photo. A photo is kind of um, us living beyond our mortal lives in posterity. The uh, ancient Egyptians believed that when they die, their tomb should be enshrined with every bit of image of them that is devoid of any of their personality or imperfections. That way they can show that they've lived a perfect life and go into the afterlife. And, and, and perhaps, you know, we, we carry that thought on. We want to live with the knowledge that uh, our images are, are showing us in the best light. Here's, here's my thing. I, I think that wouldn't we want people to see us as individuals, as, as people who weren't perfect, but we've got a story to tell, each one of us, different than the next. The very thing that makes our partners fall in love with us, or our loved ones remember us. It could be a crooked smile. It could be laugh lines in the eyes that show how a person optimistically looks at life. But there is something about personality and distinction and character and individuality that I'm trying to not Photoshop over. I want to celebrate. I find that that's my wabi-sabi. That's the beauty in the imperfection. And, uh, and as long as I'm able to, I'm going to keep seeking out perfectly imperfect people because they're the ones I find beautiful. Thank you.